Hi there and welcome to this PowerCrest video on current limiting breakers and LV cable selection. In this video I'll be looking at something called the cable length conundrum. I'll be explaining what it's about and how it can be overcome when doing cable selection by using current limiting circuit breakers. Now in order to do this we need to take a quick look at power cable with stand ratings. The general adiabatic temperature rise equation for cable heating is as follows, right? E is I of squared T, which is equal to K squared times S squared. And what do these stand for? Well, E is the energy absorbed by the cable during a fault situation. IF is the symmetrical fault current. And T is the duration of fault current in seconds. Now K is a constant depending on cable material, the initial and final temperature, where S is also the conductor size in millimeters squared. So we have that E is a measure of the amount of thermal energy the cable can absorb starting from an initial temperature to a final temperature beyond which cable damage will occur. So for example, final temperature is 250 degrees for XLP and 160 degrees for PVC. So K may be found in relevant cable standards documentation and so E may be determined for various cable sizes. We can then rewrite equation 1 to get that the fault current is the product of K and the cable size S divided by the square root of T. And so for various values of T the maximum current the cable can withstand can be determined using equation 2. So from this, withstand rating tables can be constructed for cables, such as the following. Right, so we see here, the table 1 represents the withstand ratings for XLP or EPR insulated copper ca power cables, where the initial temperature is 90 degrees. So for example, if you look at a 4 mm squared cable, if the fault duration is 1 second, the cable can withstand 571 amps before it reaches its critical damage temperature of 250 degrees, right? Starting with an initial temperature of uh, 90 degrees, right? But if the fault duration is reduced to only 0.5 seconds, then the 4 mol squared cable can accommodate 808 amps, or if you go down to 0.25 seconds, the fault current it can accommodate increases to uh, 1143 amps. And of course, note that these ratings are equally applicable to single phase as they are to three phase cables. Now for those in the NEMA IEEE world, a similar table may be constructed for AWG cables as shown here. So for example, if I have an AWG2 cable as shown over here, my one second rating is 4803 amps, which goes up to 6793 amps for a 0.5 seconds fault duration, and if the fault is only there for 0.25 seconds. The fault current the cable can accommodate is now 9,607 amps. Again, for this table, initial temperature is 90, final temperature is 250 degrees. Okay, so the minimum cable length conundrum. Right, let's consider the following network. Here I have a source, transformer, and a cable and I have a fault F at the end of my cable. Now, suppose the transformer LV network is 380 volts. So, the question is, what is the minimum length of cable required to ensure that the three-phase fault current at F does not exceed the cable fault current rating for a given time? Right, so, for an example, I have a source which is 500 MVA, transformer is 1.5 MVA, and my trip time for the fault F is 0.2 seconds. 
notice my cable has a fault at its end which means it's a through fault with regards to my cable right I wrote an Excel spreadsheet to aid with the calculations okay so let's work through this my voltage as I've said before is 380 volts source is 500 MVA X of R is 8 and from this I can get my complex source impedance being this value over here note Complex algebra is required as our impedances are complex quantities, R plus Jx. Transformer size is 1.5 MVA, impedance is 6, X of R, and so I can calculate my transformer impedance in complex format as well. K I got from tables is 143 and my maximum fault time is 0 0.5 seconds. So, let's suppose I start off with a 1 mm squared cable. I can calculate E right from K squared times 1 squared being 2449. Now the maximum allowable fault current right, is 202. This comes from over here, 202 amps for 1 mm squared cable uh, for my, for my uh, total fault duration of 0 0.5 seconds. Right. The conduct impedance again from tables is 0 0.0233 and I've neglected the inductance since the resistance is way more than the inductance. Now let's suppose my cable length is only 20 meters so I have a pretty short run of cable. So my cable impedance is 0.466 and I can then calculate the total impedance from the source to the fault point which is given by this value over here and so the fault current is 470 amps that's the through fault current for a fault at the end of my cable now we can see 470 exceeds 202 so cable fault rating exceeded yes not good so what to do well I uh, can have a look at increasing my cable size. So let's look at a 1.5 millimeter squared cable. I now see that I have a fault current rating of 303 from the table over here. 20 meters. And I see that the fault current at the end of the cable is now 734. So even though I've gone up, in cable size I've also gone up in the actual fault current because my impedance is less so once again for a 20 mil sorry for a 20 meter run of cable I found that my fault current rating will be exceeded and actually as I go along if I look at a 2.5 4 6 10 16 25 mil squared cables same problem because the um, impedance decreases with the increase in cable size my fault current increases as well and in each case the actual cable rating is exceeded the fault current is bigger than the actual cable rating the withstand rating that means I have a problem for a short run of cable of around 20 meters right increasing the cable size is not actually going to solve my cable conundrum so looking at this again over here I can now increase my cable length to see how much cable length do I require in order for my fault current at the end of the cable to be less than the actual cable rating the withstand rating of my cable and I see for a one millimeter squared cable, for example, I will need 33 meters. For 1.5, I need 35. So 420 is less than 429. For 2.5, I need 38 and so on. So my average threshold length, right? The TL, the threshold length is 36.88 meters. Note over here, 
but the TL is determined by factors such as the network impedance and the fault duration. So for example, if I increase my fault time from 0.25 to 0.5 seconds, I get the following results, right? Maximum fault time is 0.5. I see that my threshold length for a one millimeter squared cable has now gone up to 47 meters. 49 for 1.5, 55 for a 2.5 millimeter squared cable, and so on. So with a longer fault duration, I need a longer length before my fault current, here being 200 amps, drops below the, the maximum allowable fault current, the cable rating. Okay, so how to overcome the cable length conundrum? Well, one possible solution is to increase the cable length, right? So the cable may be looped, right? This, of course, will increase its length. And certainly this has been applied in the past successfully in many instances. However, it will have limited success, especially where cable trades are already congested. Also, it may lead to additional derating factors having to be applied if the cable being looped is in the vicinity of other cables. So you may have to apply derating factors to the other cables or to your cable in question as well. Now, the second option is the use of an upstream current limiting circuit breaker, right, or a fuse. Right, current limiting breakers have the ability to interrupt the fault current within the first half cycle so that the prospective maximum fault current value is never reached. The action of the current limiting breaker, of course, restricts the let through energy of the breaker to a value only a fraction of what would have been the case had the breaker not been a current limiting one. Okay, so here we can see what current limiting is all about. The green curve over here is the prospective fault current. In other words, the fault current that would have flowed had there been no current limiting action. The red curve is the actual fault current. And you can see that the peak of the actual fault current is way less than that of the prospective peak, right, due to the current limiting action. Okay. Also, the area under the red curve, which is the let through energy, right, is way less than the area under the green curve. This is the energy that would have been let through had there been no current limiting. Right, so let's look at our case again. Here we have a current limiting circuit breaker, which I've called the MCCB, or I have a, in particular a molded case circuit breaker, which is current limiting, now at the cable source end. Right. Now, for the example above, right, the fault level at the cable source is 36.2 kA, so which I'll round off to 40 kA, just to be a little bit more conservative. Now, I can use the manufacturer's let-through curves to determine the maximum let-through energy of the uh, MCCB for the given prospective fault level. Right, so here I have a typical curve. And I see for a prospective fault level of 40 kA over here, the let through energy is 0.7 times 10 to the 6 m squared second, right? So I'm sitting here with 0.7 or 700,000 m squared second. So I can now say if I go back to my particular example, right? I need to look what cable, right, what cable actually has an energy, right, the fault energy, the value E that we calculated earlier, which is must, that has a, a value of E greater than 700,000, right, because this cable would be able to accommodate the maximum allowable through fault energy of the breaker and it would be fine because it's 
maximum allowable temperature of 250 degrees would not be exceeded. And I see here that the cable that can do this for us is a 6 millimeter squared cable. Right. Of course, the 6, 10, 16, 25 all comply, but the minimum size is a 6 mil. 4 mil has the thermal capacity being 327, 184, which is below our 700,000. So 4 mil, 2.5, 1.5 or 1 will not do. I will need a 6 mil squared cable. So for this application, if I have a current limiting breaker, the minimum the minimum cable size I can use is a 6 mil. So we have, of course, that the minimum cable size that can be accommodated is a 6 mm squared if I use a current limiting circuit breaker. Note also that as the fault location moves from the cable source to the cable end, that the actual fault current decreases, which implies a decreased lateral energy, which of course improves the situation. So that's it for this video on current limiting breakers and LV cable selection. I do, do hope you've enjoyed this PowerCrest video. So I would like to ask you to please subscribe, share, like and comment. It will be much appreciated. And you're welcome to visit my website at www.powercrest.net. Thank you and till next time.